So let me introduce our last faculty speaker of the morning, Professor Nir Yosef. He's an assistant professor in EECS and a member of the Center for Computational Biology here at UC Berkeley. The overarching goal of Nir's research is to utilize high throughput genomic data sets, mostly based on DNA sequencing, in order to build models that explain how gene expression is regulated. He's especially interested in immune cells covering various aspects of their biology, such as their differentiation, stability, plasticity, and response to acute st stimulation. His talk today is, is on how genome scale profiling of immune cells may lead to new discoveries and therapies for autoimmunity. So please welcome Professor Yosef. Good. Okay. Well, uh, so yeah, I'm the one who separates between you and lunch, of course. So that's kind of my job to make uh, to make it uh, quick, but hopefully also interesting for you. So the uh, alternative and maybe less catchy title of my talk is basically how can we use genome scale profiling uh, as a tool. Uh, genome scale profiling of immune cells as a tool, um, as a research tool, to make new discoveries and design new therapies for autoimmunity. So the mental image I want you to have when we kind of start talking about, uh, about what we do is this overall scenario where we have some inflamed tissue that we are interested in studying, uh, and we put it through uh, some sort of instrumentation uh, where we can generate high throughput molecular profiling, all sorts of types of molecules, and I'm going to specifically talk about RNA today. And then with this data, a lot of data, we process it, we do some computation, we do some statistics, and then we come up with hypotheses uh, that then lead the scientific uh, progress here and, and lead us to new experiments and new views and making conclusions about the system that we are interested in. So what is that system that we are interested in? In, in my case, uh, we do a lot of thinking about autoimmune diseases. So um, autoimmune diseases are generally, here I'm using as my example throughout multiple sclerosis. So they are very complex diseases. They have very complex etiology. That means that there are a lot of different cell types that are involved, a lot of different tissues in the body, a lot of very complex interactions between those different cells, right? So this is just a, a picture of uh, actually a lesion from the brain of a mouse with a model of multiple sclerosis. So uh, when we look at the tissue like that, we want to ask some basic questions that will allow us to understand, maybe investigate this disease, which is what types of cells are present in my tissue? Uh, which functions do, they sell, do these cells carry? How do they interact with each other? Uh, and how to mitigate the inflammation? How we can use all this information to mitigate the inflammation? So uh, what I'm going to try to do today is, instead of giving you some highlights of the, of the things that we do, I want to take you from basic principles, really from the most fundamental concepts, and take you through uh, one example showing how we can do these things, especially in MS. So, yeah, so I mentioned that there are a lot of different cell types that are present in, 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 in an inflamed tissue, right? So if you look at the, what kind of immune cells do we have in our body, so you can see that we have many different types of immune cells. A lot of them are generated from the same precursor population, like the hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and they are present throughout our body, and, but they are very different from each other, even though they develop from the same precursor. They can be of different sizes, different shapes, and different functionality, and so on. Now you may ask yourself a question that is you know, pretty straightforward here, is, well, all of these cells have the same DNA. They have the same DNA. How come they are so different from each other? What makes them so different from each other? So, of course, here the reason for that is, has to do with what you just described to us and Jennifer earlier today, which is that maybe all of these cells, all of the immune cells in our body, for example, a macrophage and a dendritic cell and a T cell, all of them have almost the same genome, but what they don't do is, uh, they, uh, what, so the question, what makes the cells different from each other? So, um, what makes them different from each other is that they read different parts of the DNA. And what do I mean by reading different parts of the DNA? By reading different parts of the DNA, I mean expressing genes, right? So as uh, many of you uh, uh, probably know, genes are basically small segments in, in our genome. About, they comprise about 2% of our genome. So uh, here, for example, we have this small loss in the genome. Of course, this is just a cartoon that represents the T-cell receptor gene. Uh, now, in the process of uh, transcription, what happens is that uh, the cell can actually copy use this uh, gene as a template and copy it to an, another independent molecule, which is an RNA molecule. And it can make many, many of these template molecules, 
right? This is what we call gene expression. This gene is expressed, and we have all these RNA molecules that come out of it. The next step in this life cycle is exactly what Hume was talking about, which is this translation process. We have the ribosome that takes these molecules and turn them into proteins. And the proteins uh, that are generated from the RNA, they actually carry out most of the functions in the cell. For example, the TSA receptor protein sits on the membrane of the cell, on the, on the surface of the cell, and it's very important for the interaction, the communication between the T-cell and the environment of the T-cell. So now we can go back to my question and ask, okay, what is the difference between, how come cells are very different from each other? So different cells read different parts of the DNA. So for example, if you look at RNA molecules inside the T-cell, we're going to see a lot of RNA molecules that came from the T-cell receptor locus. But if you look inside an innate immune cell, like a dendritic cell right here that interacts with the T-cell, we almost don't see any expression, any activity in that locus. Because basically it's not needed for that cell. So now we can just zoom out for a second and ask the, the, the larger question. Okay, so I know now that the, the, I have this, you know, I have the DNA, I have the RNA being expressed from that, but how can I tell which part of the DNA a given cell is expressing? or a given cell is reading. Uh, and the problem is actually fairly complicated because there is not one or two or three genes. There are about 20,000 genes in the human genome. So, and what I would like to know is how many RNA molecules are produced from each and every gene. So in a sense, what I want to have at the end is a table like this, right? That for every gene, tells me how many RNA molecules are produced from that gene in that specific population of cells that I'm interested in. Right, so this is our problem. So how do we tackle this problem? What's it? Basically, here is the technology question. How do we tackle this problem? And the answer is RNA sequencing. So that's a fairly new technology, about 10 years or so, that has been around. Uh, and it's been very, very useful. So how does that work? It works with, let's say we start with our, you know, we have sample of interest. Let's say, again, let's say it's an inflamed tissue. Uh, what we do from there is we extract the RNA by using certain enzymatic reactions. And then we put it in a test tube, right? So basically, we extract all the RNA from this tissue, and we have it in a little test tube right here. The next step is to fragment those pieces of RNA that can be fairly long into small chunks that are about, let's say, 300 base pairs long. And also do a process called reverse transcription, which in a sense, it's exactly against the, the central dogma of molecular biology. It goes from RNA back to DNA. So what we have right now is we have these short fragments of DNA, each one of them is a short sequence over A, C, T, and G. But they actually came from the genes that are being expressed here in this tissue. The last part that we are going to do, because these are short pieces of DNA, we can use a DNA sequencing machine. So we can feed those things into a DNA sequencing machine, and then we get data. The data is basically long strings, again, anywhere between 100 and 200 uh, like, characters long, uh, that represent the sequences, the A, C, T's, and G's of these small fragments. The next thing that we want to do is to take those, uh, those, we want to take those genes, I'm sorry, those, those, uh, uh, those little strings, and for which, and at the end what we want to do is we want to close the loop, right? We want to have some quantification of expression from every position in the genome. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through each and every one of those sequences and ask, and look at the entire, the sequence of the entire genome and ask for each one of those, where in the genome did you come from? So for example, this sequence came from the green gene, or from, sorry, from the, from the red gene. So I'm going to put a plus one on the red gene. Okay, we have one RNA molecule for this one. And then again, we're going to do it for the next one. Okay, one for the green gene, and so on and so forth, right? So we can do that, and in a, in a given experiment, we have about 10 million of those reads, right? So we take each one of those reads, we align it against the human genome, which is, of course, a very interesting uh, problem that, uh, that is very fun to work on. We, we don't do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're getting is this table, the table that we wanted, right? So for every gene, we have some proxy for the amount of expression, for the amount of RNA molecules that we have from that gene, okay? So basically, RNA sequencing allows us to, uh, to take a sample, process it to a very, very um, uh, kind of standard, uh, in a very standard manner, and at the end, get this table. And this table here, the expression of genes, gives us a lot of information in our samples, um, which we can start using to, uh, to address our ultimate goal here, right? So remember, here we have a tissue, and we ask all of these very fundamental questions. What kind of cell types are in the tissue? How do they, how do they operate? And how can we stop, how can we do something to mitigate the inflammation, for example, in the central nervous system in multiple sclerosis? Right, so, so here is the first thing that we can do. The first thing that we can do is we can say, okay, let's, let's design this experiment. Let's take a, a, a healthy tissue, and let's take an inflamed tissue, Right, from, from both of them from the same, from the same region. 
uh, and for each one of them, extract the RNA in the tissue, extract all the RNA in the tissue, and run RNA sequencing. So then I can get uh, some sort of an idea of gene expression, oops, of gene expression values in the tissue, right? Uh, in the healthy tissue, in the inflamed tissue. Now we can do some, we can try to find genes that are different. Uh, they have a different amount of expression, different amount of transcription in the inflamed and in the healthy tissue. And that can give us all sorts of very interesting things. For example, in this, for example, we can say that we, we can see that we have a lot of T cell receptor expression, and we have a lot of MHC class two uh, expression, which basically tell us that we see a, a, a lot of activity in the interface between the adaptive immunity and the innate immunity. These two cells kind of talking to each other. Well, that's nice. That's nice, but it's still it's it's not very it's not very satisfying uh, still, because if you think about it. Uh, we have all these different cell types, right? And we take, when we extract the RNA from the tissue, we basically mix everything together, and we look at some average uh, from all of these different con contributors to the data. So uh, there is one an analogy for that, which I think is pretty catchy, and, and I think captures the, the idea well. What we have here is, in a sense, we have an immune cell smoothie, if you will. Where what we actually want is an immune cell salad. So you can say, okay, okay, if I want to make a salad, how about that? How about I make a salad only made of strawberries? So in our case, we can say, okay, let's use biomarkers and only sort T cells, only T cells, and then do the same analysis again. Okay, so extract RNA from the healthy and inflamed tissue, but only of T cells, and then do the comparative analysis. And that can give us, again, all sorts of things that are very informative. For example, we can find molecules oops, that are specifically expressed by T cells, but by T cells of different flavor. For example, we can see interleukin-17, which, for example, here, that is very pro-inflammatory, and interleukin-10 here, that is very anti-inflammatory, that can tell us something new. But still, it's not satisfying all the way because uh, we are basically limiting ourselves to the, to the limits of our knowledge. And what we know is that there are many, many different types and subtypes and sub-subtypes of T cells that can have very, very different functionality. So again, we want, what we have is a T cell smoothie and what we want here is a T cell salad. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? So of course, we can uh, go and isolate each one, each and every one of the sub 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 populations, but it becomes very, very big, very, very expensive. And also, there are many of these sub sub populations that we don't even know about. So, uh, the idea of what we would like to do is to have kind of an unbiased, one shot, data driven quantification of the composition of the tissue of interest, right? So for a, given composition, for, for a given tissue, I want to know what is the composition when we look at the canonical types, but also want stratification of these canonical types into subtypes or transitional states that can be known, but can also be new. So how do we do that? Yeah, so here are my examples for, yeah. And new macrophages, macrophages, some new T cells here. So how do we do that? So let's go back to the, uh, to the RNA sequencing uh, thing, right? So in this traditional technology, traditional, it's only about 10 years old. Uh, so um, we start from the tissue, we extract RNA, we lice millions of cells together here usually, right? And what we're getting here, we're getting one vector which gives us the average over all of these cells. Now here's the new kid in town, the new fancy technology, single cell RNA sequencing. What single cell RNA sequencing can do, it can basically lead us from the vector to the matrix. And now, basically, instead of having, oops, instead of having an average, instead of having an average, sorry, instead of, instead of having an average over many, many cells, we actually get information of gene expression in each and every individual cell. Now, this it's a fairly new technology, very, very popular now. It started in about 2014. Uh, the current scale is about tens of thousands of cells, right? So already starting to talk about very, very large matrices, thousands of genes, tens of thousands of cells. The large data set have over a million cells in them. And this technology really opens the way for an unbiased characterization of tissue composition, but also much more. There is much more we can do about it. It's very exciting new technology. Just to say that this technology is enabled by uh, improvement and some work on microfluidic devices that can really help us do these reactions for every cell independently in, 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 on micro scale uh, and doing, doing so very efficiently. Okay, so um, this was a long introduction to a lot of the work that we do in my group. The thing that we do in my group is basically sit and stare of those huge matrices of genes over cells and ask, so obviously we see variability here, right? But we can ask, what can this variability teach us? What does it mean? What can it teach us about immunology? 
And the one thing to think about it is that the variability that we see in this matrix is a superposition of many different factors, many different components that create the variability, right? So different, different uh, determinants of cellular variability. So for example, cells can be of different types, right? They can have a B cell and a T cell and a macrophage in the same sample, so it's a very important source of variability. Uh, cells can be on phenotypic gradients, uh, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today, but, but they, are, uh, they, they are there as well. For example, the capacity to induce inflammation. We can have temporal processes like the cell cycle or like developmental gradients. We can have genetic variability that can also exist between cells even in the body of you know, a single person, for example, in cancer. Uh, we can have metabolic variability, which we do a lot of work in. I'm going to comment it a little bit at the end. Uh, but the, maybe the most, the, the, the most annoying uh, source of variability, the nuisance source of variability that is very dominant, is technical variability that is uh, caused by measurement error. Now, as I said, you know, we, we do all of this uh, work in the group, kind of developing all of these tools, developing methods, developing software to extract each one of these sources of variability, look at it kind of in isolation, see what it can teach us about biology. And we apply it in all sorts of domains. Uh, for example, we had some, um, we had a few papers, you know, with, with experimental colleagues. So what we do, we basically try to extend the ontology, the known ontology of cell types in the human body, and that led us to find, for example, a new subtype of innate immune cells that are very important for protecting against HIV infection. On the other hand, we found a very, you know, a new subtype of T cells. Uh, that are very important to, for in inducing uh, inflammation, inducing autoimmunity. So, uh, but today I'm going to tell you about you know, one, one very specific story that really goes into the question on the composition of a tissue. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so our goal, that's what we want to do. We want to have a data-driven estimation of the cellular composition of a tissue. Right? So uh, our starting point is single-cell RNA sequencing of that tissue. We get all this data. Right here, oops. We get all of this data right here, right? This big matrix. And now what we want to do is we want to be able to learn some structure from this matrix. What does it mean learning some structure? One way to think about this problem is to, is to learn a meaningful cell-cell similarity map from this matrix, right? So if I'm giving you two cells from this matrix, which is basically two columns, and I'm asking you how similar are they to each other, right? So you can think about all sorts of ways. You can look at their correlation. You can look at the Euclidean distance and so on. But these are not necessarily very informative because they can be uh, very, very much perturbed by noise and by maybe not very interesting genes and so on, right? So it's a very big challenge in the field in general how to represent the data and how to find these maps of cell-cell similarity that mean something biologically. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is when I have this map of cell-cell similarity, I can look at the various structures that, that I see in the data. For example, we can have hierarchies, we can have clusters, we can have gradients. And now the question is how to annotate it. Biologically, what does that mean? How can we put in an automated way, how can we put labels and say, okay, this, this is what it means. Okay, going from numbers to English, if you will. So uh, both of these problems are uh, very fundamental problems. Again, uh, uh, maybe two of the hottest problems in the field to, to date. The reason why these problems are very hard, one reason is that there is a lot of noise in this data, a lot of bias, and very, very limited sensitivity. So a lot of these matrices are actually zero, just because of limited sensitivity. So ideally, what we would like to have is we would like to have, behind each and every one of these data points, we would like to have, instead of a single measurement, we would like to have a distribution, a full distribution. And the question is, how do we do that? So, um, and that, of course, will facilitate doing some probabilistic analysis uh, kind of to all of these different steps of finding the structure and doing the annotation. So, kind of really taking into account uh, of the noise and the uncertainty in the data. So, the idea behind inferring these, these, uh, these uh, distributions is to get to the realization that these matrices that we see are not full rank. The, the actual rank is much, much, much lower than, the, than their dimensionality. Or in other words, cells can correlate with each other very much, and genes can correlate with each other very much. So the idea is to infer these distributions by looking at cells that are very similar to each other, and kind of looking at the noise, and looking at the genes that are very similar to each other. A more principled way to do that is to take the original matrix and then reduce it to a small dimension. So basically now, instead, every cell, instead of being represented by a vector of length 5,000, it's represented by a vector of length 10. And by doing this compression, we are really doing this sharing of information between similar cells and similar genes. And then we can, and then we can blow it back up, to, but this time not to one matrix, but to three matrices that give us some of the moments of the distribution. In this case, it's a zero-inflated negative binomial. 
So uh, there has been some previous work on that. That's a not, of course not a new concept. Uh, but what people have done uh, is that the operators that they've used here were linear operators, and the methods themselves weren't very scalable. They could, you could not apply that for more like than 10 or 20,000 cells. But when we look at this data, we realize that we actually have an opportunity here because they have a lot of data. A lot of data means that we can actually use deep learning. So that was the, uh, that was the idea here. We basically use a variational inference uh, or variational autoencoders. We call this uh, framework ACVI for single cell variational inference. In the, so in a sense, what we do is these operators here that go from the matrix to the latent space to the small dimensional space and back to the moments of the distributions are neural networks. So what it gives us, it gives us non-linearity, which is very important to catch really a, a important aspect of similarity between cells and between genes. It is very efficient running on a GPU. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we can do all sorts of uh, things with it. It's very, very um, general. Right, so I'm going to quickly uh, go over the, uh, um, kind of, again, touching the, on, the, on the two main problems that we talked about before and see how we can use that. So the first one is to learn biologically meaningful cell-cell uh, similarity map. Uh, so in a sense, the first part of the model, what it gives us, it gives us a low dimensional representation of the data, right? We start with this very, very large matrix, and we really compress it down to, to 10 dimensions. Uh, but then we can use these 10 dimensions as a way to evaluate the distance between every two cells by just taking the Euclidean distance in this small dimensional space. Now what we find is that this, uh, this matrix space, the similarity between cells, really captures biology pretty well. So for example, if your data comes from a tissue, like let's say the cerebrospinal fluid. Where what we're expecting to see there when we look at the immune cells is just like terminally differentiated cells that are very much distinct in their clusters. And indeed, this is what we see when we look at the data. This is just a TSNE plot uh, of, of the of the cell-cell similarity map. So basically, two cells that are close to each other here are similar, two cells that are far away are not similar. Uh, another way, uh, just to show that it is indeed uh, um, flexible, is that if you look at the bone marrow, where we actually ex expect to see developmental processes, like here, going from the, from the stem cell to the, to the uh, lineages, uh, and we do the analysis here. So again, we see that the algorithm actually does capture the continuity of the process, going from the stem cell population into the different arms of hematopoiesis. So um, another thing that um, we can do here is that when we, when we basically have a generative model, given the data, can give us uh, the distributions be behind every data point. So we have a fully probabilistic way to look at the data. And it gives us a way to actually do a very principal hypothesis testing. And one of those things, one of these hypotheses that we can do is we can do differential expression. For example, we can take uh, cells from this cluster and cells from that cluster and ask ourselves which genes are differentially expressed between these two. And what we've shown is this procedure by the, of, the, uh, of doing this differential expression analysis is fairly accurate and better than some of the state of the art that is out there. Right, so I, uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip. So we also do a lot of work on the, uh, on the annotation problem, also using this probabilistic framework uh, as a way of addressing it. I'm going to skip that part in the interest of time. And uh, I would just want to say that uh, this tool, what it gives us is basically an end-to-end, -end, a, a scalable end-to-end -end framework to do, uh, to reason and to do analysis of this single cell RNA sequencing data. This is just one of those nice plots that show you that we can process about a million cells in less than an hour. So uh, the remainder of the time that I have is, um, is just to show you really a quick example for uh, how we go and apply it in, in multiple sclerosis. So uh, we worked with uh, uh, Gerd Zuhotzer from uh, my colleague, uh, is a neurologist uh, uh, from Germany, and basically what, the, what we did together, we looked at uh, cerebrospinal fluid, so it, uh, from uh, MS patients and from some healthy controls, or some from con controls, and we compared them to each other with single cell RNA sequencing. And we asked all these fundamental questions. What kind of cells are present in this tissue? How do they interact with each other? How do they drive the disease? So we do the analysis, we do single cell RNA sequencing analysis, and the first thing that we can do, we can really map the, the composition of the tissue in terms of all of these main cell types that we know from the immune system. And we can compare them to each other, and we can see some things that are different between the healthy and the control, but maybe the most interesting uh, results here came when we look not at the canonical cell types, but rather looking a bit under the hood of some sub and sub subtypes of T and B, uh, T and B cells. And specifically, what we see is that there are two very specific flavors of T cells and B cells that are uh, more abundant in those, in those, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, 
individuals with multiple sclerosis, and specifically these are uh, mature B cells that are antigen experienced, uh, and a very uh, specific type of T cells that are interacting and regulating the activity of those B cells. So that led us to a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the specific type of T cells, what's called T follicular helper cells, they help enhance this uh, MS-like uh, uh, autoimmunity by locally supporting the uh, response and the expansion of B cells in the tissue, which was a new hypothesis. Uh, so I we went ahead and tested it. And what Gerd did here, he basically used the mouse model of multiple sclerosis, but basically you can take uh, healthy mice, induce the disease, and basically follow uh, them for about three weeks and looking at their symptoms. And he looked at two types of mice, just regular mice and another type of mice where he deleted about a few hundreds of base pairs that fall exactly, out of all of these many millions, that fall exactly in the gene that regulates uh, the development of these T follicular helper cells, right? So it's a very, very minor deletion in the genome of these mice. But what you can see, so basically this is time, this is how sick the mice are. And we can see that the mice with this very uh, mild deletion develop much, much less severe disease which tells us we basically were able to, this, you know, which, uh, this is just one experiment out of many, to show you that this hypothesis actually leads us to some new insights, to some new understanding of the disease, and think about new ways to mitigate it. Right, so uh, I'm just going to skip this one, and just to say that you know, we are not the only ones who are very excited about single cell technology. Uh, there is actually very uh, you know, internationally wide uh, enthusiasm and a lot of resources that go into that. Uh, it's all organized under this organi you know, organization called the Human Cell Atlas, um, uh, where they, you know, the, the, the declared goal is to complete the 150-year-old uh, journey to identify all the cell types in the human body and how these composition of cell types change in disease as a foundation for actually doing information-derived uh, medical applications in autoimmunity, in infectious diseases, in cancer, and in others. Um, to me, what's the most exciting uh, thing going ahead is going beyond the atlas and actually coming up with mechanistic model that explains how tissue work and how cells really interact with each other in a dynamic way. So I'm gonna skip uh, that and just to the acknowledgements. So uh, the, um, the VAE model was a very fun collaboration with Mike Jordan's group here in Berkeley. Uh, the students who work on it are Romain Lopez, Channing Wu, Michael Cole, and Jeff Rieger, and our colleagues uh, in Germany. And thank you for listening. <laughs>